You know what James Gunn's presentation really needed? I'll give you a moment to try and guess. It's pretty obvious, I think, especially when you realize what it is. It's small, but I think so crucial, I think it would have made a big difference as to how the, the pitch went over to fans. And that's logos. The guy should have had logos. I know that Warner Brothers Discovery doesn't have a lot of money these days, but James Gunn could have made them himself. He could have gone on Photoshop and whipped up some logos. One of you did. Bob P. made these beautiful logos for us to use in this video today. They're gorgeous. Thanks, Bob, for sending them to me. He even has the Elseworlds logo on some of them and he, uh, HBO Max on the ones that are shows. They're beautiful. They really make you feel like the project is on its way to becoming something. Uh, and I think, I think that James Gunn's presentation was quite vague and it didn't even have the logos to kind of anchor our, our hope and dreams. Kevin Feige, you know, he do, he's of course been using logos the whole time quite successfully. Uh, and he's even moved up to concept art in his pitches as he did for Thunderbolts, which I think was incredibly effective. But yeah, I think Gunn should have had uh, logos. But so we're going to use these in our discussion today because it's hard to get excited about a slate with no overall plan or cohesiveness that at least we know about. Maybe Gunn has it, but he just doesn't want to share. No real talent attached in front of or behind the camera besides Gunn himself. Uh, maybe James Mangold might be joining. Uh, he's circling Swamp Thing. Uh, no deal yet. He has another movie that he'd have to make beforehand, so it wouldn't be anytime soon. But he's interested, and James Mangold's a pretty darn good catch. Uh, we'll incorporate that into our discussion of these uh, projects in this video. Uh, but then also a trinity that's supposed to be cohesive, but so far seems to include a Superman in his 20s, but a Batman who can have a teenage son and a Wonder Woman who isn't even going to show up in her own show for at least the first season. But let's try to get excited about it. You know, yesterday there was a lot of trepidation and concerns, but let's, you know, this is presumably what we're getting. So I'm going to rank the 10 projects today for Gun's, uh, Gun Slate. Five movies and five shows. I'm not going to include the two Elseworlds projects, uh, the Batman Part 2 and Joker, uh, Joker 2, because I think it would be unfair to include them because they have, they have nothing to do with Gunn's story, by the way, the overall story. Uh, he wouldn't really get credit for their success because he's not involved in their creation. In fact, Matt Reeves said, get away from me. But they're friendly. They are friendly, largely because Gunn did get away from him. Uh, and then their sequels. They're delivering on a known quantity, whereas Gunn's stuff is totally unknown. We have no idea what we're going to get. So of course, the two Elseworld projects would easily top this list. So let's not even bother to include them. So what am I going to factor in here in my top 10 ranking? All right, I'm going to factor in the viability of these projects from a business perspective, my own personal opinion as a DC fan, DC fandom overall, uh, and potential mainstream interest. You know, people who like movies, but aren't particularly into comics, which is actually the biggest group. Now, as I share my own ranking, as always, I invite you to share your own rankings and thoughts down below. Now, also, because I'm starting from the bottom of this list, yesterday, some of you were a lot, I mean, I know a lot of you agree with me that, you know, we don't really know what to make of this, and it doesn't seem that exciting just yet. But some of you were like, why the negativity? Can't we just be excited about something for once? But please note that we're starting with the bottom of the list, so I'm going to be more concerned about these projects. But as we go on in the video, I shall become more hopeful with the ones that I feel have the best shot. All right, because so, a lot of you have said you prefer working your way up a list rather than down it, so that's what I'm doing. All right, number 10, the authority. That's right, dead last. To me, it seems like a waste of everyone's time to work on a fringe superhero team from a DC Comics acquisition rather than one of the many teams that DC is famous for that I think fans would much prefer to see brought to life on the big screen. Uh, I heard that this is, as I said yesterday, setting up a Superman versus the Authority movie and a big event movie. But as I also said yesterday, I think we would all much rather see Superman fight his classic villains, which he has not yet fought in live action. We've been asking for Brainiac for at least a decade. At least. Why is Brainiac not the villain of this movie? Uh, I, I also think that it would be impossible for Guns or whoever takes over this movie's uh, version of the authority to be able to compete with the complexity and nuance of The Boys the Seven. How is the authority not just gonna seem like a ripoff of that, quite frankly? 
Uh, the only members of this team also that comic book fans have ever shown an ongoing interest in are Midnighter and Apollo, which is really a what if scenario for what if Batman and Superman dated. That was the commentary that was created there. You know, just like the boys, the authority was supposed to be a version of, you know, the DC archetypes uh, or, you know, sometimes Marvel too, you know, just, you know, playing in that sandbox, but because you weren't part of one of the major you know, DC or Marvel companies, you didn't have the same restrictions. So the authority is cut from the exact same cloth as the boys, which is, I think, another problem for it. Because we already have the boys, and the boys is brilliant. But Midnighter and, Midnighter and Apollo are very cool, and they do have their fans even today. So why not just do a Midnighter and Apollo HBO Max series, especially after how well The Last of Us Episode 3 went over? I mean, that went over, that was just an explosive reaction of awesomeness. I mean, that like it made Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett like overnight sensations. So imagine what you could do with Midnighter and Apollo, like the superhero version of that. To me, that's far more interesting and fresher and new than The Authority, which to me, again, is just going to tread the same ground as The Boys. All right, number nine. Creature Commandos, similar issue. Why invest time establishing this team when again there are so many other DC teams that people would be more interested in? Also with Universal working to bring back their iconic monster movies, a brand that they've cornered since the 1930s, it seems needlessly aggressive from DC and therefore Warner Brothers Discovery to say, move over, we want to have monsters too. You're like, you already have the superheroes. Universal doesn't have any superheroes. Like, let them have their monsters, man. Why do you want to pick a fight with Universal? In some ways, I just kind of see this as a way to keep Gunn's brother employed. I mean, who watched the Suicide Squad and was like, when's Weasel coming back? We thought we got rid of him. We were like, whew, that was thankfully brief, but yet here he is. Uh, plus, Gunn has said he already wrote these scripts. He already banged them out. And I got to say, when it comes to team stories, Gunn has not shown a ton of range to date. Maybe he'll surprise us. I mean, but I mean, even though that sometimes does happen, because ever since Heath Ledger was so good as a Joker, everybody always says, well, maybe we'll be surprised. And sometimes we are. But you're not surprised every time, so that's, you can still have some concerns. Uh, all right, number eight, Swamp Thing. I did move Swamp Thing up a little higher. Well, would he have been high, uh, lower, considering I don't like the two teams, these other two teams? But I do like James Mangold. I think that's a good idea. That makes me kind of excited for Swamp Thing, because James Mangold apparently is a fan of the material, which always helps. He gets it. He gets what makes Swamp Thing popular. And he's the sort of big name director at this point that that can get the attention of mainstream viewers. I mean, you can put on the trailer from the director of Indiana Jones. Oh, I hope Indiana Jones is good. But from Logan and Girl Interrupted, etc., etc. So you go, oh, a 310 to Yuma even. People who liked it, liked it. So you're like, oh, maybe this is pretty good. Ford v. Ferrari. I mean, there's good stuff here. Uh, but I have to say, Hollywood has tried to make Swamp Thing work before. Multiple times. And it has not worked out. Swamp Thing might very well be the Aaron Taylor Johnson of DC. People just aren't interested, no matter how cool something a few people think that they are. Uh, I'm, I hope they don't make it him Bond, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. All right, so anyway, I think in this case, though, if they can build, with James Mangold, with that kind of talent, if they can build an interesting story around Swamp Thing, uh, and then Swamp Thing fans will be happy because Swamp Thing is in the mix. But if they can have other great characters that we're working with here, particularly maybe other DC characters associated with the green, like Poison Ivy, well, then maybe this could really work. In fact, I think if you put Poison Ivy in there for sure and used Swamp Thing in the green to better explain and update her powers to modern storytelling where people like stuff to be a little more grounded, this could actually be pretty good. So that, that's what I would say. You might be like, but I just want Swamp Thing to focus on Swamp Thing. Don't you want Swamp Thing to be successful? Put Poison Ivy in there. All right, number seven, Booster Gold. To me, this all hinges on casting, cameos, and tone. Uh, or I guess if I want to do three C's, casting, cameos, and comedy, as in style of. Booster Gold is a super positive, super dumb, super hot version of Deadpool. Now, I thought yesterday, as I said, that maybe Gunn would bring over Chris Pratt from Guardians of the Galaxy, and Chris Pratt would be incredibly well cast in this role. But I saw a couple of you on social media recommend Glenn Powell and Billy Magnuson as well, and those are exciting choices as well. Also, I love those choices. I'm like, you got, particularly Billy Magnuson, I'm like, you got something there. As Booster Gold is from the future, and he's a super fan of the heyday of superheroes, his past, our present. So to see Booster Gold geeking out over some of our favorites, you know, in a meta-type way, could also be really endearing and engaging. 
But that's where tone slash style of comedy comes in. This cannot be Gunn's raunchy style of humor, because then it would just be Peacemaker. Booster Gold is sweet and silly, and so you need a writing team and a director and an actor with that type of sensibility. Even, you know, before, uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds became Deadpool, he would have been a great Booster Gold. Booster Gold is actually very similar to Guy from uh, Free Guy. Very similar to that character, that kind of naivete um, and fandom. So I think, you know, that's what, that's what you should be thinking. Now, I have to tell you, this also sounds a little bit like Marvel's Wonder Man upcoming series, because uh, that's going to have a planned emphasis on Hollywood. So that'll be very meta and very fun and very cute and upbeat. And, and it has that same kind of, I think it, even though it's a different kind of hero worship, uh, I think the meta quality is what is going to like make them seem similar. And Wonder Man, which is already casting, is likely to come out first. So I think it'll be difficult for Booster Gold to compete with that show. All right, number six, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Anyone who has read this comic knows that this could be amazing. But I do think that it would, have, it would be extremely expensive to do it correctly. Uh, although they could use the volume, although sometimes people don't use the volume correctly, so that would be concerning. Uh, but in today's climate, I'm not so sure how... At first, I was going to say this was a Thelma and Louise type storyline, but I would, ex I would instead say it's really a female version of Lone Wolf and Cub, to a degree. But it's a revenge odyssey against these two women getting revenge on a guy. You know, he's a horrible guy, he deserves it, but, you know, two women hunting down a guy across the galaxy, you know what toxic groups are going to go off on that. And so I don't think this would be a four-quadrant movie. So then how do you justify spending so much money to make it? And a drunk Supergirl? Again, tough sell to the masses. Tough sell. The right actress could pull it off, though. And the right, you know, you have to really showcase that she's drinking from despair you know, not that it's super cool. Look how, look how, look how, uh, look at Supergirl. You know, you don't want to glorify a, a drinking problem. Uh, so, I mean, because, you know, she's, she's haunted by her past, what happened to her home planet. But with the right casting, the right behind the camera talent as in director and writer, amazing visuals and scope and incredible action sequences, this Supergirl is so powerful. It is so cool to see. This could really be something. And I have to tell you, I really feel that the, what the pitch here was, was a female Mando. I bet that was the pitch. And that's a pretty darn good pitch for this. Number five, Paradise Lost, which right out of the gate seems to have a lot of problems. But it's still number five on my list. Allow me to explain. All right, so first off, problem section. It's a Wonder Woman series without Wonder Woman. Also, as a friend of mine who loves Wonder Woman comics pointed out, the whole point of Themyscira is that they're all kumbaya over there. So where is this Game of Thrones style intrigue going to come from? The Greek gods? Their patrons? Maybe that's it. That could be cool. And then how will this stand apart from HBO Max's other almost all-female Game of Thrones-esque upcoming show, Dune the Sisterhood? And then also don't forget, there's House of the Dragon, which is legitimately a continuation of Game of Thrones. They're going to have three Game of Thrones style shows, uh, not only do you wonder if they can succeed in, in duplicating that success, successful formula twice, both of them being all women, but are they all going to cannibalize each other? I would have concerns. Usually it's a competing network that wants to duplicate another network's success, not a network that says, hey, we have a hit show. Let's water it down by making a bunch of the same. Uh, but... I think there could still be something here because I think that the Wonder Woman mythology has never really been explored very well. She also has, I mean, she has a lot of great villains too, but because this is Themyscira based, it wouldn't be going into them. Maybe Circe, maybe Circe. But for season one, it would be focused entirely on Themyscira. Still though, there are great Wonder Woman Easter eggs and there are great Wonder Woman characters, uh, a lot of them that could be explored and none of them have ever really been given the chance to shine. So that could be exciting for DC fans. Uh, I think it could be great. Uh, and also a show about Amazons would be guaranteed to have amazing action set pieces, correct? And then also this would be the lesbian version uh, and also maybe they could explore trans storylines uh, just the way, you know, we talked about Mid Midnighter and Apollo and how that kind of would build off of the success of The Last of Us episode three. Uh, you know, the Wonder Woman has a very strong LGBT fandom, I think more than almost any other DC character. And I think uh, for a show that would be adult and serious and would focus on Themyscira, a, a world of all women, you'd have to go there. It reminds me of that hilarious SNL sketch, which was uh, so funny. Uh, but you know, done right, 
on HBO Max, which is the perfect audience for that type type of a show, uh, a little throw a little euphoria in there, maybe it could be, it could be very popular. All right, number four, Waller. I didn't like the Suicide Squad movie, as many of you know, and I didn't watch Peacemaker. I didn't even watch Peacemaker because I just felt it was very offensive and just not for me. Uh, and there are a lot of people like me. I know that, that there's a very vocal fandom for this style of, you know, what Gunn has created here so far, but, you know, not great, not great ratings in box office. Uh, but anyway, I, I do love Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. I really do. And I love that Crystal Henry from Watchmen is spearheading this new show. I think that's a great match. But Jeremy Carver is also working on the show. He's actually, he's in the DC overall writer's room with Henry. But, you know, he comes from actually Doom Patrol and Supernatural. And while those shows certainly have their fans, I hope that CW energy doesn't show up in Waller. That would be very concerning for me. Very concerning. As I already said, this cheapo shot from Peacemaker is very disturbing because that, that's not how Waller should look at all. The fact you compare this shot to how she's looked in the movies, even Black Adam, you're like, you're not going to continue with this, are you? And, you know, to be fair to Carver, maybe he's another Eric Kripke who created Supernatural and leveled up brilliantly with the boys. So who's to say Carver doesn't have range? But... I'm a little nervous about his, his uh, inclusion. So basically, if Waller is like Succession or like what Secret Invasion seems to be like over at Marvel, that could be incredible. But if, it's just an, if it truly is just an extension of the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, very silly and very raunchy and kind of low budget, it'll still keep that fandom, but it's going to have limited appeal. And I, it would be much lower on this list if that's how it was going to turn out. So we'll see how it takes shape. Number three, Superman Legacy. I would really love to see a classic Superman story finally done right. Nobody's done it. Even the Christopher Reeve uh, movies weren't perfect with a silly Lex Luthor and sequels, you know, that got progressive, you know, they didn't really capture the magic of the first one. What I'm looking for, and I believe a lot of people are, is a live action Superman, the animated series, but updated for today's modern world. I think Captain America got an edge on Superman with the mainstream audience because Marvel very cleverly had, you know, Captain America really speak for the 99% against the 1%. Poor Tony, he got saddled with representing the 1%. So that was, that really helped the Captain America character, and I think Superman they haven't found a good hook for Superman. In fact, they've recently just decided to go with the son who is bisexual and because he has some of his mother's genes is like a little bit more of like edgier and a little bit more willing to like investigate things like a reporter. He's dating a reporter. And, and so that's, you know, that's how hard Superman stories are to tell right now. DC itself even was like, let's just try a different Superman. Uh, so it's a tough, it's a tough character. Now, Peter Safran has said that this new movie is going to explore if there's a place for Superman's kindness in today's world. And that sounds, that sounds interesting. But is James Gunn the guy to write that story? I did appreciate some elements of his Suicide Squad script, like the discussion about between Rick Flagg and Peacemaker. I thought that was very compelling. And some of the scenes with Ratcatcher and Bloodsport. So maybe James Gunn could write this story. Maybe he could. Casting here, though, as well as Gunn's script, will be key, and not just for Superman, but across the board. They have to get Lois right. They have to get Lux Luthor right. This is extremely important. But again, Superman stories are just really hard to tell. Superman is very popular as an idea. People love the logo. They love to envision themselves as Superman. But for some reason, they don't really turn up for Superman stories. So if they could make a Superman movie as good as some of the Batman movies have been, that would be exciting because number two is Brave and the Bold because people really love Batman, myself included. I love Batman. We just can't get enough. Sure, some DC fans complain that he's always in, he not only gets all the attention, but he gets shoehorned into other projects. But hey, you can't argue with results. The guy gets people to make a purchase. Uh, for a very long time, fans have said that we want to see the Bat Family done right in live action. That's what was so frustrating a little bit about the recent Titans show, is that they tried to explore the Bat Family and again did it in very CW fashion. Uh, if we could get it done right, just imagine how amazing that would be. Now, Gunn is cheating and jumping to the end of the line with the latest Robin, Damian Wayne. I love Damian. I don't like James Gunn's dis 
description of him. I think that Peter Tomasi actually has written the best Damian Wayne, even though Grant Morrison created the character. I think you have to really show Damian Wayne's inner struggle. He's not a jerk. I think he's entitled, and I think he comes from two very different worlds, half assassin, half vigilante. And I think you really need to show that schism within him, which is what makes him such a fascinating character. If you just make him a jerk, James Gunn style, again, that's going to limit the character's appeal to mainstream audiences. Uh, But anyway, Gunn hinted that even though the current Robin will be Damian Wayne, that means maybe other Bat family members are already in play and could potentially show up. That's very interesting to me. Because even if this movie is a total show story-wise, if they can have the Bat family show up and look, at least look good in live action, action sequences, and have like little tete-a-tetes, people are gonna go crazy. The the movie will get a ton of attention and generate a ton of interest online. So for better or worse, I mean, it might just again be like watching a car wreck, but it will get a lot of attention. It, It could be very, very cool. So I hope we get something good, but we're gonna get something and you know, in terms of blowing up, blowing up the spot for DC, that movie would definitely do it. Like, I'm just imagine, like imagine this, but in live action. Ah, it's the Bat family's way too big, by the way. And I don't like Harley Quinn being in the Bat family. She's supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an anti-hero with poison ivy, the Thelma and Louise type situation. So I really hate her being a member of the Bat family. But whatever. All right. Number one, Lanterns. I am as shocked as you that that's my number one, because while I love Jon Stewart from the animated Justice League series, I'm not a big Green Lantern fan. Uh, My favorite Green Lantern story is Blackest Night, but that's because it involved lots of other DC characters, and it was an amazing crossover event that was, uh, you know, publisher-wide. It went across all the DC titles, and it was really good, really, really good. And yet Green Lantern happened to be involved, kind of. But this is going to be a smaller show, which Gunn has pitched as a true detective type mystery. But instead of police, regular police officers or detectives, it's human members of a larger space police force investigating something in their sector, Earth. I like that. That's cool. DC fans are starving for a good, a good Green Lantern live action story, something that they have never, ever gotten. And with both Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart working together here, you pretty much cover your bases in terms of making all Green Lantern fans at least moderately happy. You even get casuals like myself who like Green Lantern from the larger Justice League stories, including especially the animated series. And with Gunn also promising that their investigation will blow up into something with major ramifications for the entire DCU, something that would create like a, some kind of, he did, cause it's a, he, he didn't say even at all what it could be, but he hinted that it would be something that would maybe pull all of this into focus. I don't know if it's a good idea to wait that long to pull this into focus, but if it does pull it into, all into focus, that would put intense interest on this story. Because if Gunn can deliver on that and actually cr- deliver one heck of a mystery with an incredible reveal that just blows our mind and again makes it all make sense, this would be one heck of a show. It would be that kind of peak HBO Sunday night television, which generates an intense weekly discussion online which is what franchises covet these days and really, really need. So again, if done right, Lanterns could not only be big, but it could be a prime example of how today's franchises can use TV and film together to create massive hype, you know, turn hype up to an 11. Even Marvel hasn't even really been able to do this yet. Uh, I think Wanda is the closest they've come. And look how effective that was. So this could be great. So that's my rankings of the Gunverse so far. I'm excited to hear again your own rankings and thoughts down below. uh, Share those thoughts, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.